we really couldn't have done this project without all of you that are involved in this discussion today. Um, so thank you for taking the time out. Thank you for bringing value to our audience. Um, and thank you for being a milestone in Fashion Revolution India's journey as we discussed gender equity and its impact on sustainability in cotton farming in India. I'm delighted to have um, such esteemed panelists with us. So thank you to Abhishek Jani from Fairtrade India, the CEO, um, who will be adding huge value to our um, discussion about cotton farmers and in particular women cotton farmers in India that are on the ground. Um, we will also be hearing from our global policy director, Sarah Ditti, um, without whom we wouldn't have been able to develop this policy dialogue, um, which goes hand in hand with the support of British Council. So Jonathan Kennedy, thank you very much for joining us. Chai Spur, who's from Oroville, but he'll tell you more about himself later. An incredibly inspiring change maker um, and who actually sparked our initial journey into discussing gender equity, which was further enhanced when we liaised with Somadish Banerjee from um, Intellicap, without whose advice, um, you know, we're, we're, inter we're eternally grateful for all the advice that Intellicap gave, and particularly you yourself, Somadish, not just from Intellicap, but all the work that you have done from the agricultural perspective in the past. And um, Kirti from Ochai, who heads Hot Ochai, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think it's going to be great for the audience to understand how, as a retailer, you can really put some of the knowledge that we have into practice. Um, and it would be great to get some perspective of your findings and your journey as you established your brand. Um, I believe that we have covered us all at this point. Delighted to see um, so many in the collective. And at this point, I am gonna hand over the baton to Jonathan, Jonathan Kennedy, who can then um, unveil the report for us, at which point I will share it for you all to view. Thanks very much, Suki, and a very warm welcome from Delhi. The British Council is delighted to have partnered with Fashion Revolution on this vital research focused on gender equity and the impact on sustainability in cotton farming in India. This research makes a hugely positive contribution to the roles, challenges, and opportunities for greater gender e equality for the long-term sustainability of cotton farming in India. Women make up most of the cotton farming workforce in India while their contribution to the cotton cultivation process is integral to the craft economy. And yet their importance as a major stakeholder is too often undervalued. This research aims to redress this serious imbalance and make an important contribution to policy dialogue in craft and design in India. And is a key part of the British Council's Crafting Futures Programme a program that is firmly focused on the empowerment of women as the engine for change and enterprise in the crafts and design economy. The British Council's arts aims to be a catalyst for crafts and design sectors in partnership with India and the UK for cultural development as we connect, create and collaborate. So it's hugely fitting, therefore, to launch the research with our partners as a key part of Fashion Revolution Week and Earth Day today. So with all that said, I'm delighted to hand back the baton to Suki Lasange, Country Director of Fashion Revolution Week India, and to launch the research. Over to you, Suki. Thank you so much, um, Jonathan. I am now sharing and officially unveiling our policy dialogue report. And do bear in mind that this was actually an, a pilot project. 
which kicked off um, towards the end of 2018. So throughout 2019, we, we've been busy researching, writing, reporting, and developing our dialogue. However, it's the first time it's been seen publicly, and it's the first time um, it's being unveiled. Um, it was only fitting that we share it during Fashion Revolution Week, um, and prior to that, share with our stakeholders that we're all a major contributor to the um, to the curation of this report. Thank you to the British Council for your continued support. Um, the report's been authored by our head of policy, who's based in Delhi in India, um, Shruti Singh. She will guide you through um, elements of the report that we've selected for this discussion today, um, following our brief introduction. So thank you to our advisors in Telecap, Karan Kumar and Samadish Banerjee. Um, we will, we, the, the length of thank yous that we could give are endless, so I won't use today's discussion for that. Um, however, you will see um, in our report that we do have um, definitions of forward and acknowledgement, so do take a moment to read those. At this point, it's only fitting that I invite Sarah Ditti, our Global Policy Director, to set some perspective in terms of how we got to this point and what this means for fashion revolution and beyond. So Sarah, please do join. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Sarah Ditti, the Global Policy Director of Fashion Revolution um, HQ based in London and I'm very pleased to join you all today here to launch this incredibly important contribution um, to the discussion of gender equity in cotton farming in India, a topic that is too little discussed I think we'll all agree and really looking forward to hearing um, from Shruti later about the contents of the report. Um, if you don't already know much about fashion revolution, we've been campaigning for greater transparency, um, better working conditions and environmental sustainability within the global fashion industry since 2013. Um, we were formed as a result of the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh on the 24th of April last year, um, which is of course the anniversary is on Friday. Um, and that was a day where more than 1,100 garment workers were killed making clothes for big name brands we find in shopping malls and um, our high streets around the world. And many of the companies producing clothes in those factories didn't know that their clothes were being made there. And that is what that was really what led us to identify that the lack of transparency was such a huge problem in this industry. But of course, you know, transparency doesn't stop at the factory floor. Um, there are many other parts of the value chain that rarely receive much spotlight, um, especially by the public and by the media. And, you know, cotton production is really one part of the supply chain that can often remain hidden in the shadows, even though it's a sector that globally employs millions and millions of people and, you know, and, and India and, and employs millions and millions of people for whom many of those people are women um, who are often overlooked um, as part of the role of cotton farmer. And, you know, it's, it's, for us, it's essentially, the logic is kind of that it's impossible to understand um, the impacts of our clothes as consumers um, or the impacts of the industry as policymakers if we don't know where the garments and the fibers that we're wearing um, came from, who grew them, under what conditions, at under what environmental costs. And that's really what we're hoping to change, um, to make fundamental systemic change. And so in order to, to try to create change um, in the industry, we are really focusing on creating change at three interrelated levels. We're focusing on changing um, the culture of fashion. So looking at um, what consumers understand and demand about their clothes. We're looking to change the industry itself. So influence brands and retailers, um, influence suppliers and manufacturers um, and companies throughout the value chain. And we're looking to influence um, 
policy and regulation. And that's really what this policy dialogue is intended to contribute to, is to our um, advocating around policy change. And thus far, our policy change efforts have really focused, you know, as a fashion revolution, fashion revolution movement have focused predominantly on um, more of the consuming countries. So countries in Europe and the UK and Australia, um, a bit in the US and um, and we've, we've made some significant impacts on trying to make steps towards um, policy change. So for example, we were quite involved in the passing of the UK Modern Slavery Act in 2015, which of course means that companies in the UK doing a certain level of turnover are required to report publicly on what they're doing to root out forced labor in their supply chains. Following that, our Australian team was very involved in the passing of the Australian legislation. And now we're working um, with a group of 65 other NGOs and community groups across Europe to um, advocate for similar sorts of le legislation and mandatory due diligence at the EU level. We've, been, we've actually been very involved in um, and been a key voice in change in the global textiles sector um, at the European Parliament. Um, I myself have given evidence to the European Parliament um, over the last couple of years um, when there's been a number of different legislative or policy tools that they've been considering relevant to the garment and textiles um, market. Here in the UK last year, the actually in 2018, um, the UK Environmental Audit Committee, which is quite a powerful committee, also launched an inquiry into the sustainability and human rights impacts of the fashion industry. Apparently that inquiry, inquiry was actually inspired by the fashion revolution movement. Um, and so we testified in, in front of the committee there um, and hoping that we'll see eventually some sort of um, legislative action come to fruition from that. So the policy dialogue program um, that we've created in partnership with the British Council is really our effort to explore what positive and constructive policy change um, might look like in other countries um, where fashion revolution teams are already doing such great work to mobilize the public and to engage with the industry. Um, and to really lead cultural change in their communities around the fashion and textile sector. Um, and so that's really how this policy dialogue project came to be. And the India uh, project here, which are, you'll hear about from Shruti in a minute, um, is one of the pilot projects of this program, along with a, a sister project, I suppose you could call it, in the Philippines, but looking at um, the importation of secondhand clothing. We have now, um, we're now in the process of doing two more pilots uh, with the British Council in Rwanda and in Kenya. Um, again, looking at issues relevant to sustainability in their local um, national context. And we are basically at the end of this, what we're going to be doing with the outcomes of these policy dialogue projects is using this to feed into fashion revolutions wider global policy advocacy strategy going forward so that we're kind of pursuing policy change in many different regions in many different countries um, with a consistent sort of aim with a consistent message so the research conducted by the fashion revolution india um, into the gender dimensions of cotton in india it's just it's so important you know gender equality discrimination um, against women. These are issues that are affecting countries, communities, workplaces all over the world in varied, complex, and you know, deeply important ways. And we're incredibly grateful that our India team has embarked on this fascinating and quite participatory journey to understand more about how these issues affect um, sustainability issues in particular, and lots of different issues affect um, women cotton farmers. So we hope that these insights, we know that these insights will um, and recommendations will prove useful to us um, as a global fashion revolution movement and 
to the British Council, but we hope that they also prove useful to you and to the wider Indian and global textiles industry. So thank you so much for having me today. Great, thank you, Sarah. So to continue, I'll share um, some of the pages of the report. It is 45 pages long, so we won't go through the entire report. We'll stick to a summary and a little teaser. The report is available on fashionrevolution.org forward slash India, and you can download it and also view it in ISU. We do recommend that you share it with your network and um, read it and we will be available for some ask the questions through our social media channels throughout the week. Um, so essentially, as we touched upon earlier, one of our initial findings, so when we first embarked on uh, wanting to write um, a policy dialogue uh, for India, this being a pilot project, initially we had a brainstorm and um, we collaborated and thought really long and hard about the subject that was most passionate to our team. Um, and lo and behold, it was cotton. Um, we were initially just gonna be looking at the supply chain from seed to ginning. Um, but as we, dug, as we dug deeper into the subject, um, we it sparked interest into really looking at gender and the role that gender plays in cotton farming in India. Um, there is a lot of research out there and certainly from the direction of our uh, advisors, um, this then led to us focusing on gender equity. Um, essentially women make up the majority of the cotton farming workforce in India. And although they play such a massive contribution to the cultivation process, um, we felt that their, well, we, we discovered and learned that their um, value and importance as stakeholders is massively undervalued. So we really wanted to explore if this dialogue could then reach out to our network and see how unlocking that potential together with policy um, could really um, make change for a better and more sustainable um, livelihood for them in the future. So there's a number of key insights which are summarized um, on, on, in the executive summary to make it easier for you as an audience to get in a snapshot the direction we're going in for our report. Um, this particular page in the introduction, I think the um, Kiss and March was really important to show at the forefront of um, a galvanizing movement that occurred in India. Um, there's a lot that women want to say, there's a lot that agriculture, there's a lot as a dialogue um, to be had here. And policymakers um, did respond in some respect, and we'll go into that later. Um, I think what's uh, more prevalent now is right now, we also in this dialogue want to explore how um, the current pandemic is affecting um, women that are working on the cotton farms. And I'm sure that Abhishek will ex develop a little bit of dialogue on that later. Um, but essentially the Kiss and March was when in November, 2018, over 100,000 farmers, men and women, marched in solidarity to parliament from all over the country. And they really did want to demand that pol policymakers focus on um, the crisis. Um, we share a little bit about that and go into a bit of detail about the background. Um, and also policies that are relatable to that movement. Um, essentially, to simplify the process and the baseline of cotton farming in India, uh, we did chart out some of our findings here and research methodology. So essentially, as the quote says at the um, top left of the report, uh, it is important to recognize the dignity of life and labor of women making the fashion that you are wearing. So coming back to fashion revolution, we do ask you to be curious, to find out and do something. Uh, do think about um, the fabrics you are wearing. And beyond that, um, 
do engage in dialogue, not just asking who made my clothes, but also ask who grew my clothes, which is a question that Fair Trade India often urges their networks to. And beyond that, what's in my clothes? What does it take to get my garment to become um, what it is hanging in my wardrobe? Um, so essentially, the objective of the study was to understand the role of women in cotton farming and the challenges faced by them in achieving cotton farming sustainability and then to assess the impact of current farming practices on cotton sustainability. The, the um, policy dialogue wouldn't have been complete without recommendations, so we really zoned in some, into some recommendations to address the problems and to leverage women's roles in optimising their value, promoting cotton sustainability and minimising economic risks for various stakeholders that depend on cotton cultivation. Um, and that includes brands, designers, ginners, spinners, mills, traders. Uh, if you think of the cotton supply chain alone from seed to product, that's quite a long supply chain. Many hands um, are passed through that chain. Uh, we're looking at one element of it. Um, so there's a number of um, explanations of our stakeholders throughout the supply chain and then how women come to play in that section and Shruti will share a bit more detail on that front. And here you can really explore those challenges in terms of causes and effects uh, on the problem tree and I do believe that um, Shruti will expand more on that in her presentation which is coming next. We've kept the report rather visual as we are also just to keep the viewer engaged and to get a real perspective and reality of the faces and the people and the hands that are involved in our cultivation processes. Like I said, we have 45 pages, so I am not going to go into further detail. The report is available. You can download it now on fashionrevolution.org forward slash India. Um, this is but a mere taster of what you are to see and read. We would like your feedback, so do share your feedback with us. Um, and now it's only fitting that I pass the baton to Shruti. Shruti, Head of Policy for Fashion Revolution India, who um, invested a lot of time into writing and researching this report together with myself. Um, over to you, Shruti, and do share your document. Thanks, Suki. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, this policy dialogue uh, has been an incredible journey, and we have learned so much through it. I'm excited to share some insights and highlights from our report, which you just saw. Um, let me jump right into it and share this with you. Um, are you all able to see my screen? So this dialogue looked closely at the role of women farmers on the field, the challenges that they face, and discover the opportunities which can be leveraged so that women can truly become agents of change in bringing sustainability to cotton farming. So what happens is when we think of farmer, most people instinctively think of a man plowing the fields. But if you see this um, image on your screens, which uh, was shared earlier as well on Kisan March in 2018, you can see that this picture is truly representative of their contribution to the field. Majority of cotton farmers, cultivators, and laborers are women. And yet, as one of our stakeholders pointed out, everything in agriculture, whether it's the tools, the way the physical spaces are designed in markets, the policies, everything is designed keeping in mind men, men farmers. So this needs to be corrected. This mismatch is something that we looked at. 
and we analyzed the current issues faced by cotton farmers from a gender lens. This um, shed a light on why it's important to actively engage women to solve the sustainability crisis in cotton. Uh, let me share some statistics that paint um, a better picture about their current scenario. Research by IDH indicated that women spend 80% of the total farming days on the field as compared to men who spend about 20%. They work the same number of hours in the field. Additionally, women have to take care of the twin responsibility of handling household chores as well. So they end up working long hours on, at home and on the fields. The work at home, of course, is uh, unrecognized labor, but even um, as you can see on your screens that the contributions are significantly more and they're important, they are paid only 50 to 75% of what men make. This is uh, shaped by the prevalent social norms and mindsets towards women and um, women who are primarily responsible for stubble picking, sewing, weeding, cotton picking and storage. Their work, although it's time consuming and drudgery prone, um, their work is considered to be lighter just because they are not using heavy machinery or tools on the field like men do. According to another study, uh, only 38% women feel empowered to take decisions regarding farming. So this brings the focus on how important decision-making and being gender inclusive in decision-making and policy process is for women farmers. There are many systemic uh, reasons for the way women's role is shaped and perceived um, currently. And um, these current practices have a huge impact on their welfare and on the sustainability of the crop production. So we explored deeply in our report uh, how social, economic, political, and health and safety challenges impact women's activity on the fields. So issues such as low mobility, uh, low wages that I mentioned before, lack of enforcement of labor rights, access to formal credit, and lack of financial uh, literacy um, health con contracts which are biased towards men. Uh, all of these issues are extremely important when we are thinking about recommendations. The impact of these issues, as you can see, range from low productivity and quality of the crop to health and mental well being issues. Um, it impacts their families, their household incomes, which ultimately pushes farmers into a cycle of poverty and indebtedness. So our stakeholders came together to develop this dialogue and build recommendations around these challenges. There were five policy areas which were um, identified for targeted interventions. The first was um, how to improve farmer recognition and gender inclusivity in public policy and decision-making forums. The second focused on how to improve the access to financial institutions and financial literacy. Third, on capacity building and training of women farmers. Fourth, on how to improve um, alternate livelihoods and add more sources of income because cotton is a seasonal crop. The fifth focused on how to build sustainable partnerships within the cotton supply chain to be able to impact. Mm -hmm. all the yes. Shruti, sorry to intervene, just a quick question. Can any of the panelists view the presentation that Shruti is sharing? I believe that it's still on the same slide, the cover. Shruti. That, that's right, that's, that's right. right. So oh. expand and scroll. Yeah, yeah. I, I multiple ways. The good thing is to browse through it. Smart of technology. Quite easily answer. Are you able to see it now? We can only see the front cover. We'd like to see the remainder slides. Um, great content, but I know you have visuals to accompany that. I know, I'm just trying, maybe I'll just stop share and share it again. Can you see a different slide now? Now we can see the yes. cycle of poverty. Oh, and I was speaking all through the slides. <laughs> <laughs> we can share it and upload it on our page afterwards. So that's not a problem, but you could just refresh and okay, there we sure. go. Good now. So to continue. Sure. So these are the policy recommendation areas that I was um, talking about. Now you can see them um, on your screens. 
In the report, uh, we further went and developed those policy areas into actionable policy recommendations. And this is how it looks, um, the page, where we have uh, short-term, medium-term, and long-term policies. And we have also written which stakeholders can be included, how to execute these, and what are the challenges that you can expect um, while executing these um, policies, and what is the preferable expected outcome of these policies. So in total, we have about 29 recommendations under the five policy areas that I've mentioned before. I will quickly take you through some of the really interesting recommendations that came during this dialogue. So there were recommendations that spoke about regulating the farmer labor contract and making it more gender inclusive and enforcing strict monitoring on ground. Then there was another one which spoke about building gender inclusive infrastructure in farms and markets, such as having toilets, resting rooms, feeding areas for nursing mothers, because these physical spaces we believe can further promote gender inclusivity and promote farmer, uh, women farmer participation in the market, market facing roles. Increasing the tech, technical knowledge programs on cotton sustainability. And um, in fact, that goes hand in hand with increasing the number of women trainers, as you would read further in the report. And mandatory representation of women in cotton industry bodies, such as APMC, CCI, cooperatives, and uh, farmer unions. One of the most interesting um, insights and recommendations that came up was how we could build women to women uh, emotional and financial solidarity through the, throughout the supply chain, uh, like it is seen in other crops like coffee in South America. And another one of my favorites is how em employing women in other parts of the garment manufacturing can add alternate sources of income for them. So women could be taught how to sew, embroider, create prints, and this could be done through the existing self-help groups, which are very active on the ground, or through individual brands. So these were some of the recommendations. You can read more um, in our report online. I will end with um, a quote from one of our stakeholders, which says that every stakeholder can make a difference when they choose to procure from suppliers that uphold fair, transparent, and gender equitable global standards. They create space for a more sustainable cotton industry to bloom. I hope today's dialogue, we can spark a further dialogue on potential solutions and ideas. Looking forward to it. Over to you, Suki. Thank you so much. I think you could stop the share now, Shruti. Yes, done. It's a bit fiddly. So, I think it's only fitting um, after that summary that we now bring um, the wonderful CEO of Fair Trade India, Abhishek Jani, to the dialogue um, to share some of um, the experiences and knowledge that um, Fair Trade India has in terms of cotton, women cotton farmers in India um, and how policy is potentially to affect change or has um, been a hindrance. Over to you, Abhishek. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, uh, Suki, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be a part of this panel. And um, I also want to congratulate Fashion Revolution India for really bringing together a substantive report, uh, which talks about gender equity in cotton farming. Now, if you look at the report, you see that it picks up the broader themes which those working in you know, the rural agricultural context are aware of that agriculture per se uh, socially and economically discriminates against women. But I think in the current context um, with the outbreak of the COVID-19, uh, this report has a special relevance and significance because uh, with the onset of um, economic distress and so far in the initial periods of the shutdown, there has been uh, economic distress, both in rural India and to some extent in urban India. But uh, of course, there's a, a projected slowdown in economic activities, uh, which is expected even after the uh, shutdown is lifted. And typically what we've seen is whenever economic distress um, kind of increases, uh, it is the women and the children who get most exploited. So, you know, in this context, 
uh, where we can see um, in the garment factories already, uh, the workers are suffering because of the decisions made by some of the brands. Uh, we will also be seeing the ripple effects of that across the agricultural context into rural India and particularly um, affecting um, cotton cultivators who are women. So I, I really welcome this report um, and I, I really appreciate the fact that it, it looks at it in a very holistic manner. Um, looking at it in the context of legislative interventions, I think the report highlights certain uh, important uh, interventions which could have significant impact, such as the implementation of the Women Farmers Entitlement Bill. Uh, I think that would uh, that's long due, long awaited, and it would give recognition to the significant role that women play. And there are a number of other recommendations also in the report. But what I want to focus on a little bit right now uh, is uh, on the implementation. Because so often we hear about some great policies uh, all being passed through legislation, but uh, when it comes down to the implementation, uh, you know, there are huge gaps. Uh, and I th also feel that this also expands the role uh, of this report as well as uh, of the work uh, to include other stakeholders, stakeholders uh, which are other not-for-profit organizations, businesses, uh, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning through farming communities. And, and so therefore, it's important to uh, just spend a few minutes talking about that. Now, in the context of fair trade, um, when we are looking at, um, you know, generally ensuring sustainable livelihoods for farming communities, um, a key value that we have realized is the need for bringing in collectives. And, and that's how actually the entire fair trade model starts as well. And something that the report also touches upon is that, you know, the farming communities need to build that social capital, uh, whether it's through a farmer producer company uh, or whether it is through um, uh, forming of a self-help group. Uh, so in the fair trade context at a structural level, uh, you know, we talk about bringing the, the groups together. In addition to that, we also look at other uh, standards that fair trade has, uh, which specifically focus on non-discrimination on, on lines of gender, uh, ensuring that women, if they want to be and, uh, you know, are a part of the community, they can become members of uh, the farmer producer companies or the groups or the societies. Uh, we also have uh, policies uh, to, to prevent any abuse. Um, and in due course, we actually encourage and support uh, producer organizations to develop their own gender policy. So mapping what is the role of women in their community, uh, understanding in different points in the cultivation process where they're involved and how uh, the, the capacities need to be built. Um, you know, on the implementation level as well, um, beyond the fair trade standards, um, we see that um, we have programs that Fairtrade internationally conducts. Uh, so, for instance, we have a, a women's school of leadership uh, where we provide leadership training. We, we also provide technical support and training on capacity building for financial inclusion. Um, we also look at technical training for things like good agricultural practices. So I think, you know, at, again, addressing the collective, these these skills and knowledge transfers uh, can be significantly transferred and um, add value. But what we also see in the fair trade model is um, that the community themselves in due course takes the initiative, uh, that they do support women-centric uh, programs. Um, I'd like to just take two examples um, that uh, you know um, are almost fair trade legends. So we've got a cotton farmer called uh, Lingubai, and Lingubai uh, used the fair trade premium uh, that her group had got uh, and took a loan on the, from that to basically start a poultry business. Uh, and through this poultry business, now she's actually earning more uh, than she is earning from her cotton cultivation. Uh, so again, we see that, you know, if the community is empowered, if resource transfer does take place and women are involved in the economic decision making, they are quite enterprising as well. Uh, we also have the great case of Padmabai, who not only cited a, a, a great uh, drudgery reduction uh, tool uh, collective uh, as a part of her self-help group, uh, but we also see that she actually took on leadership roles in her community and, uh, you know, became the sarpanch of her village in Patel Gura. So, you know, these are just examples of uh, women farmer coming to the fore as a part of the larger community. These things do take time. 
uh, these things need to be planned with a with the proper uh, timeline and resource commitment in place. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, with combining government initiatives and private initiatives, um, whether it's through uh, civil society interventions or the businesses, I think we can enable um, empowerment in these communities. And it's literally about <laughs> providing the tools um, and, and the communities. Uh, just, uh, just very quickly, I've got a great question here from Sunalini Matthews from The Hindu. Um, she asked the question about how can the rest of us feed into helping build um, their social capital? I mean, is, do you have any? Yeah, I, you know, uh, it's a great question. And I, I would say first and foremost, um, we need to participate in initiatives which are promoting these greater sustainability stances. Uh, so fashion revolution, fair trade, you know, initiatives such as these, which are really pushing for transparency, getting businesses and brands to really go down to the final miles, because a lot of times actually brands don't. Uh, go all the way down to who, the cultivator of, of, of the raw material. So I think one aspect is definitely, and we have the power, it may take a little longer, is to demand that transparency and that visibility. And, and then initiatives like Fair Trade, which upfront talk to you about, um, you know, showing that transparency and visibility and demonstrating specific communities which are involved in the fashion value chains. Uh, and choosing that really is an endorsement for this form of production and consumption. So I think um, as individuals, I would suggest that would be uh, one of the ways. Of course, Sonalini also has a, has, a, has a great platform and she's a, as a great journalist. So she's able to add additional value by amplifying uh, and drawing attention to some of these uh, issues which are normally hidden. Uh, and, I would, and I know she's very, uh, you know, very adept at investigating what, what is happening on the ground. So I would say that those would be the ways in which as individuals, one could contribute. Okay, and we will open more discussion later and Sunalini, if you have more to add, you can perhaps um, have converse a little bit later on. Um, I wish I, thank you, super insightful. I know that there's questions flooding in from all channels right now, but in order to keep the discussion um, flowing, um, I think it would probably be a good point to invite Gidhi from Ochai into the conversation. Um, Gidhi? Some of the audience would like to understand how um, they can really put to practice um, some of, I mean, you, you, are you there Gidhi? So my internet connection just dropped for a second, so I couldn't hear you. <laughs> the joys of technology. Yeah. Um, so let us just hit the different view. So essentially, um, give the, some of the audience members would like to know how they could put some of these learnings into practice with their brands or their journeys if they're developing um, or looking at cotton. Um, as a fabric, and perhaps you could share some of your insights and approaches in that regard. For sure. So, um, hi, I run an organization called Okai. We're a group of over 2000 women across India, mainly based in Rajasthan and Gujarat. We work with the Rabari tribe, but now we've started to work with different techniques such as soof embroidery in Rajasthan, chicken curry in Lucknow. Um, so it's a non-profit in structure. Uh, we are an embroidery organization and we are on the other extreme of gender equality where almost 100% of the artisans are women. 80% of the management team is women. Uh, most of the department heads are also women. Our communication or brand identity is of a woman and we are selling to women. So um, I guess we do not feel uh, the, the disadvantages of being in a gender, uh, not neutral space as often. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's something that we've 
it's a stage that we've grown out of where today our women are earning more than the men in their village are. And so they've already reached a position where they have decision-making abilities in a household uh, because they bring money home. Uh, having said that, as a brand, we work with pure cotton. So we source about uh, 1. 120 or 150,000 meters of pure cotton every year. Uh, one of the ways in which you can support cotton farmers or suppliers uh, who are working with cotton is to ensure where you're sourcing from. Uh, if, if they're able to share everything, if they're not shy of sharing anything. So if they're not shy of sharing where, where the farm is or who's making this cotton and what the individual breakup of cost throughout their value chain is, it's always easier to trust them. It's also, um, you'll, you'll start to sense that there is a community that is being formed uh, in sustainable fashion. And more often than not, you will feel that a lot of these brands will not share their suppliers with you. But that's not true because most sustainable fashion brands want more people to actually convert to sustainable sourcing. So whenever I've asked anybody for a supplier, they have been so helpful in sharing exactly where they are sourcing from. And it in turn benefits all of us. I think it's also very important to communicate this to the customer because especially in India, the customer is very price sensitive. Uh, fashion is all around us. It's available at a commercial website. The same dress can be purchased for 500 rupees and then you can pay 5,000 rupees for the same dress. Uh, and I've noticed that no matter how sustainable a person wants to be, when it comes to price, they will make tough decisions and the decisions uh, may not always support the value chain. Having said that, I think it's really, really important to ensure uh, that your customers are educated about the process and that they, you help them, you enable them in making that decision. I think that's one reason why we are very, very uh, uh, humble in our pricing. Uh, people may think that this is not good quality, but it's actually uh, just a little bit of margin over cost price because we are trying to get volumes of people to convert to sustainable fashion. And I think uh, that has helped us grow over the years. It has helped us be not very um, revenue focused, but impact focused. Great, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I do believe there's going to be some further questions that we'll weave into you um, a little bit um, later. Um, sure. One second. Super. Good value. Um, I'm going to now interject to bring the wonderful change maker Kais Spur into the conversation. Kais, are you available? Yeah. If we could, super, wonderful. So as we embarked on this cotton policy dialogue, once upon a time, it, you were one of the first people that I called. Um, various people mentioned your name and directed me towards generating a dialogue with yourself. So at Fashion Revolution India, we were super curious to know about who you were, what you did, and how you could help add value to this um, dialogue that we wanted to develop and one of the things you shared with us was insight into when you were on the ground in rural India you were at some farms and you discovered about certain myths myths that needed to be busted in the cotton farming industry uh, spe specifically related to women and I thought at this point it'd be nice to have you share a little bit about yourself and, and dive into that dialogue and perhaps some of the um, difficulties that or explorations that you discovered in your work with regard to cotton and gender equity. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so the story that uh, that you're referring to it was uh, it was actually about seed production, and there are many many myths. Also, I like in your report how you were writing about you know this this belief that um, women's work is lighter work. So I remember when we were talking about uh, fair trade certification and there was this conversation around uh, equal pay for equal work. 
And then the men were saying, okay, women and I, were, you know, we're, we're both doing weeding, but they just do the weeding and we carry all the weeds from the edge of the field, you know, outside the field. And that's why it's so more different. And that's why we need to get paid, you know, like 120 rupees where women would get 80. So this, I think this, this whole belief system is somehow very deeply ingrained. Um, I think another big myth is that care work is not work. Um, and uh, it, it's going to take a lot of myth busting uh, to do away with that. But this particular story that uh, I mentioned to you that time was around seed production. So you've got a lot of child labor in um, especially hybrid seed production because the nimble fingers of especially girls are um, considered to be really efficient in uh, crossing uh, flowers to make, um, uh, to make you know, hybrids. And then they were saying that if you have a virgin girl do that work, your seed will become extra fertile. So you have a lot of girls in their adolescent um, age, you know, roaming around in these um, highly profitable seed farms um, where there's extra spraying going on because you know, the risk of losing the crop is so much more than a, a fiber crop. And um, then of course you have uh, you know, hormonal um, imbalances and uh, you know, people becoming infertile and actually the opposite of what the myth um, is telling us. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um, myth busting to be done. I think what is really cool though, to, um, to flip the story around and use imagination, very similar to what Kirti was just explaining. Um, and uh, you know, Shruti, I think briefly referred to what's happening in, in coffee to use the power of, you know, fashion is a, is a sector of creativity and storytelling and it can be a, a sector of solidarity. So in coffee, what they did is they formed a, a Café Feminino, which was a solidarity brand, which united all women across the entire value chain. Of course, in coffee, it's easier because you have much less players, but imagine if we would do that for cotton. You would have you know, women co-ops growing seed, selling to women farmers, selling to women ginners and spinners, and that all the way up to women consumers. And then when you're participating in that, you know, people were asking like, you know, what can we do to participate in that? Imagine if you would have value chain communities that would actually further your values, not just as a consumer, but also as a farmer. You know, if you're a women farmer, you would sell into that chain because you know that those are your peers and those are you know, like-minded um, co-creators of a different kind of sector. So that's the kind of work that you're, I get really excited about and I'm very happy you mentioned it in, in your report. Um, and yeah, I look forward to more um, broad coalitions of different types of stakeholders. You know, Abhishek mentioned a little bit that you know, this is not just a government thing or a private sector thing or a civil society thing. It's so complex that it means that you know, all these different stakeholders, um, including also education, I just saw Nian um, was in the in the chat briefly. So she's she's training the next generation of designers. When I used to go to design academies, people had no idea where where cotton was coming from or you know what uh, what's the difference between say I know hemp or or cotton or what are man made fibers. So I think I've got a big opportunity to enroll all these different types of stakeholders in co-creating this more gender inclusive value chain. And the last thing that I wanted to say is that sometimes in this conversation, I feel that we're trying to rope in people from the informal sector into the formal sector as if the formal sector you know, is like our frame of reference. I think we need to look at it a little differently. I think the informal sector with all its inherent social capital, you know, people in a village, most, most interactions are not you know, counted in money. They are counted in different forms of wealth. Um, I think we need to shift our, uh, our frame of reference saying that this was an anomaly. You know, the way that we've uh, only started thinking of wealth in terms of money, um, that's a mistake. And actually we need to go back to the drawing board and reshape the economy, acknowledging all different forms of wealth. And there's, um, there's some interesting work on like eight forms of wealth um, which include natural capital, not just social capital, but also cultural capital, knowledge capital, experiential capital, spiritual capital. And if you can manage to you know, 
focus your attention on all these different types of wealth and capital, I think we're going to come up with very creative, different ways of uh, being and working together. So that's what I'm excited about. Thank you. Heis. Hello? You can yeah. hear me okay? Okay, super. Thank you so much. We're going to have more questions coming in in a moment, and we're just going to open the panel to um, um, have a chat amongst one another. What I do want to do at this point, following on from what you just discussed, is bring in the wonderful Samadish Banerjee, uh, VP of IntelliCap. Um, Samadish, uh, you were a fantastic steering partner for our um, policy dialogue from the initial stages, following on from when we were speaking to Chais and Fair Trade India. Um, I would love to have some of your um, perspectives in terms of um, change that you've observed or needs to happen with regard to cotton farming in India um, and any contributions you might have to add to this particular dialogue. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, good afternoon. It just trust 12. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be, you know, a part of uh, this conversation. And it's been a thorough, uh, you know, a source of thorough enjoyment uh, to be associated with this uh, research. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I basically, you know, try to bring in uh, perspectives uh, or uh, experiences from two, two uh, wearing two hats, one from broader uh, work that we do at IntelliCap, where agriculture is a very, very important sector. And we also have a cross-cutting theme dedicated to gender, which runs across different sectors. Um, and also uh, the other hat is basically from the perspective of uh, circular apparel uh, innovation factory which is an initiative of intellicap and that's something that i'm you know kind of uh, very closely uh, working on with our team um i think the common reference point from both these hats uh, as suki uh, kind of uh, asked me was uh, that you know i think guys was saying that an interplay of many many factors which goes there are so many where do you start the report also covers so many different kinds of challenges which need to be overcome um, but fundamentally i think uh, it's about changing mindsets uh, and, and that has to happen at all levels there are certain you know recommendations that you know this research has come up uh, come up with which you know kind of uh, very in, uh, explicitly indicate that it's a government which has to take a lead you know, we talked about climate entitlements and things like that those have to be very foundational uh, you know initiatives that are taken by the government uh, at the same time uh, you know there are roles that you know collectives farmer collectives uh, as well as I do believe that Sumatish has a big issue with the um, internet connection today. We might have lost I have him. Pardon? You still there, Sumatish? We can hear you. He just came back. Super. Okay, Carry I'm on. so sorry about that. Uh, bad internet. Yeah, am I audible? You are audible. All right. So yeah, quickly before you know, internet creates an issue. I would like to specifically stress on the need for, uh, you know, awareness generation initiative. Be it you know on financial inclusion. Be it uh, in terms of uh, uh, bringing in greater decision making uh, owners and uh, you know uh, assignment to women. Uh, but I think that needs to happen at a very very you know local level in terms of make, making triggering that mindset what i mean by that is i'll just you know highlight one of the many factors is so once again i do believe there's a bit of an audio issue now samadish hello can anybody hear samadish no I'm okay, just going to end up shut off. I'm just going to shut off my video. Hello. Perfect. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. 
um yeah so uh, i think sensitization uh, needs to be directed to the male members of the households and communities surrounding you know far, farming uh, cotton farming communities uh, that is extremely important because you know all of the you know all of the different uh, you know perspectives that the report talks about and also the panelists referred to uh, were you know hinting towards how male dominated the thinking is as far as agriculture is concerned now if that has to change i think it has to really uh, you know kind of start at the farming household level one of the biggest change for me would would be to change the perspectives of the uh, you know male farmers members of the households uh, of these women farmers and also the immediate community because acknowledgement of the contribution that women already make uh, you know kind of sharing more of the responsibilities and decision making uh, lenses that are there with respect to you know selection of inputs with respect to you know kind of uh, getting trained having the ability to be more mobile i think the buy in from uh, the you know male members of the community at that level is equally important that sensitization will be i think a very very important trigger our component should be a very important component of any awareness generation and sensitization drives that you know the government or other sectors uh, undertake i'll pause there uh, so okay hi thank you um samadish for that so moving further further on we are going to open the floor for some further dialogue. Um, I'm just going to tag team for a moment with Divina. Divina Singh from um, Fairtrade India. Divina, are you there? Hi, Suki. I okay. believe we've got some great um, questions from um, the floor and potential candidates that would like to ask something. Is that correct? Yes. So. <clears throat> There's some questions on the chat and we'd open it up to any panelists who would like to answer them. Is it, uh, there's a question from Apurva Kothari. Apu, if you're here, would you like to direct it to a particular panelist? Absolutely. If your network is good, Apurva, please do join in and ask the question or we can represent you on your behalf. Apurva from No Nasties. Hey, my, Suki, my network is not very good, but it's just a question for everyone or whoever feels is uh, in a position to answer is uh, what can we do to bring about policy change or influence policy change at the government level to bridge some of these uh, gender inequality gaps? Abhishek, is that something perhaps you could step in to answer? Maybe before we answer that question, Apurva, could you just give us a little nugget about um, who you are and what you do? I'm well versed with who you are, but to our audience, I think they would love to know more, should they not have heard of No Nasties and what you do with Once Upon a Duck? And then perhaps we can get Abhishek step in and answer your question. Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, for the last 10 years, what I've trying, been trying to do is to get consumers involved with the situation with cotton farming in India and the crisis with farmer suicides. Um, and uh, we run two organizations. One is No Nasties, where we do organic fair trade coating. Um, it's been over nine years since we're doing that. And uh, the other organization is Once Upon a Doug, which is a nonprofit working with an NGO in Varda near Nagpur, uh, which has about 5,000 women working there um, and the project helps to give them secondary income uh, in addition to their farming activities. So we're trying to see how we can connect uh, rural India to consumers and get consumers involved to making that change, uh, which will pick it up. So, um, and what I'm seeing is that we're doing a lot of work with the fashion revolution, with fair trade India at the consumer level. And even in our own work, we're realizing the big change is likely to come when there's a government level policy change which will influence millions of people directly as opposed to the thousands of people that we work with. So um, it's something which is beyond my scope, but this would be a good audience with a good uh, panel, maybe step in. 
Thank, thank you, Abu. I think, Abu, I think what you're doing with monasteries is phenomenal. And the fact that it supports all the farmers and the workers in your supply chain is means that you're a very important stakeholder of the fashion revolution. Uh, we move power to monasteries, and it's been fabulous to see the campaign you've run, the impact that has created. I would like to open up Bhuva's question to Abhishek or anybody in the panel who would like to answer this. The question is, is, is the government helping with this gender equality via policy changes? How can we help shape that? Yeah, hello. Yeah, hi. Yeah, so um, I think this is a very complex, uh, when you get into the workings of government, it is very complex. But I think there are, there are initiatives uh, which are already in place, government uh, policies which are already in place, which are not getting implemented sufficiently. Um, and of course, there is still room for more legislative intervention as the policy report also identifies. So, you know, just moving back to what I'd said earlier, I think different stakeholders have a role in this. Um, I think fundamentally, uh, we need to start uh, by ensuring some of the existing policies are um, communicated and those who are going to be beneficiaries or who are affected are aware of it and are involved in, in, in getting the benefits, the final mile connectivity uh, roles, uh, to be played by the not-for-profit sector, roles to be played by the by the business community in that, who are directly working with, with farmers. I think we, we've seen some great examples like, uh, you know, Chetna Organic, uh, where there has been that uh, direct participation from uh, the organization Chetna, uh, not-for-profit organization Chetna, in uh, building capacity, and then the farmers' collectives themselves taking this forward. Um, in addition to that, you know, obviously there is a role by the industry. Uh, so on industry platforms, if some, some of these issues are relevant, uh, we first need to have the women entrepreneurs coming on and then raising it. Uh, but also I think as a part of the mainstream uh, brands also recognizing these, uh, the industry can then uh, bring in some of these uh, recommendations to the government. Uh, and obviously the ultimate uh, power of the consumers in demanding it from industry and from government uh, through campaigns, through initiatives like Fashion Revolution and this report. Um, I think channelizing that energy would be another way to do it, but it would take time. And I think in the short term, we can do a whole lot of other stuff by just looking at our contribution to sustainable or unsustainable practices. Great, thank you so much, Abhishek. Um, we've got a few other great questions coming in. I believe at this point, Sinalini, good questions, and I see your two about um, within the sustainability community, uh, great to push. You're more than welcome to jump in and ask that question directly if you have a, a panelist in mind. Um, I do think that potentially Sarah Ditti could answer that first one. So Sarah, the question is within the sustainability community, uh, community will there be now a greater push to talk about women farmers? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely something that we're trying as a as the global fashion revolution movement um, to shine more of a light on workers and producers further down the supply chain. Of course, that definitely includes um, women farmers. And we have a hashtag um, that is hashtag I major close, which we encourage um, producers across the supply chain to share their stories. And we'll, we would love to hear from more women farmers um, sharing their stories with that hashtag. I think that's something that will be kind of pushing to happen going forward. And then of course, by working with organizations like Fair Trade India, for example, you know, they've written a great blog for us on our website, kind of talking specifically about um, you know, which is actually another question we were talking about earlier, which I'm hoping some of the other panelists will talk about too, is like how the coronavirus pandemic is affecting um, farmers and women farmers. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that I think will continue to 
shine an even brighter light on um, as a global fashion revolution movement going forward. And Sarah, further to what you just mentioned, going into uh, the latter part of Sunalini's um, question, which is how do we know the difference between great marketing and what's genuine? A lot of the big brands have huge spends on marketing. Are you working on labeling? Um, the first element I'd like to say um, in terms of marketing, I mean, I am, I come from a marketing background. Um, I'm heavily involved in it. I have a lot of dialogues with brands and people in multiple industries, not just textiles. Um, essentially, when I, we've come across at Fashion Revolution, a lot of brands sharing, I made your clothes. Um, it's a great visual to see um, workers um, transparently seen um, in that element of the campaign, but we don't always know if that um, that worker that has been shared by the brand is being paid fairly, what their conditions are and X, Y, Z. We do try and build relationships to develop that narrative. Uh, we like the fact that they've taken that initial step to uh, give a face to the person that's working behind the garment, uh, but it is a tricky one. And, and I think this is when we bring in the a little element about the fashion transparency index um, and 2020's fashion transparency index was officially launched yesterday globally. Um, this is something that we would love to do in India and that is one of our long-term goals. Um, but Sarah, I think you could jump in here to just add a more of, um, value to the answer for Sunalini. Yeah, sure. So the, <clears throat> the Fashion Transparency Index is now in its fifth edition. We conduct it every year and it, this year we've reviewed 250 of the world's largest brands and retailers. So that's um, brands and retailers were doing an annual turnover of over 400 million US dollars. And we've included a couple um, Indian brands this year. So Coves, which is an online retailer there, which is actually really big, um, surprising to me. Um, Reliance, uh, is included this year and there might be one other brand I can't remember off the top of my head um, but anyway we basically we try to really sift through like in, in granular detail the information that brand big brands are disclosing about their policies about their practices about their impacts and about their supply chains and really suss out like you know what what is just marketing speak and what is actually really um, useful information that can be used to hold brands to account um, and to drive change. Um, yeah, and to drive change in, in, in their supply chains. So we, the methodology looks at five different sections. The first one is policy and commitments, which is usually you know, sometimes that's often the more slightly fluffier stuff. The we have a policy on energy, we have a policy on wages, we have a policy on diversity and inclusion, whatever. And then, and, you know, policies are super important, but obviously it's much more important around how policies are put into practice and what the outcomes of those um, actions are to put their policies in, into practice. So, in the in the other sections of the methodology, then we start to look a little bit more into like, okay, so what are the specific procedures in place? What are the programs and in initiatives they have in place? And then what's the data? Um, what's the information? What are the findings coming out from those um, programs and practices that brands um, have in place? So, you know, one, are they sharing supplier lists? Are they disclosing who their suppliers are, both, you know, at the kind of garment factoring level, but at the processing and mill level, and then at the raw material supplier level. Um, and how much detail do they share about those suppliers? So do they share, you know, the facility location, the number of workers, the gender breakdown? Um, is it updated regularly? Is it available in a downloadable list so that other stakeholders can use it? That sort of thing. And then we also look for data to be shared around um, you know, what are the results of their supplier assessments? You know, often these are aud audits that um, brands will do. And we know what, what are those audits telling us? Um, what violations are being 
um, highlighted? How are those being addressed and resolved? What, what grievances um, are producers in the supply chain making? Uh, how are those being addressed and solved? And then, you know, are they sharing data about the prevalence of forced labor the, or data around um, wage rates for producers in the supply chain? Are they publishing data on their carbon footprint, their water use, um, use of chemicals, that sort of thing? Um, and yeah, obviously we, I'm sure it's not that surprising, but we find by and large like brands tend to disclose the most about their policies and their commitments and less um, about the outcomes and results and impacts and progress um, of their efforts. So that's something we'll continually um, be pushing for year on year, using the kind of ratings methodology as it's designed to incentivize brands to continually pursue um, more granular detail of disclosure. Thank um, you, Seth. Sorry, can no. I? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Silalini, um, uh, Kais is also going to jump in to answer about labeling after you. So please do go ahead. Silalini Matthews from The Hindu. Right. Um, so is it true that a process may be quite different um, in the West and maybe quite another thing in a third world country? And maybe what they're showing uh, you um, is, is the truth uh, because that's what's happening maybe in America or in Europe where everything is much more stringent. Um, whereas the moment they come to a third world nation, it's, it's just, I mean, that's not even shown. That's just out of the picture completely. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think it's actually sometimes a little bit of a myth. I mean, I think, I mean, there is, you know, historically over the past 30 years, obviously, we have seen a move towards outsourcing. Um, so countries that are predominantly consuming countries like Europe, um, the countries across Europe and UK and US have tended to shift production to countries with less regulation, you know, with lower wages, with lower um, cost of labor, you know, fewer environmental protections, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, we have seen brands kind of continually cheap, you know, chase cheaper and cheaper labor costs and environmental protections um, in order to keep costs down for products and therefore make bigger volumes. And that has been the way that the industry has been structured for, for a while and why so many of these systemic issues continue to persist around gender-based discrimination, low wages, et cetera. But I, I think what we're seeing more now is that actually some production, some manufacturing is still being produced, is still being done in, in the UK, in the US, in, in Europe. And actually conditions there, you know, aren't very good either. Um, they often, uh, you know, things go, things get done like off the books. You know, we, we have, um, you know, uncovered instances of like modern slavery like conditions in you know in Leicester um in in Los Angeles where there's lots of undocumented workers um making clothes for uh, often for e-tailers or a lot of big U.S. brands too so I think there's like a myth that the obviously we don't have cotton farming in the UK so that's a, that's a slightly different matter but um but yeah, I think there's like a myth that this is, these are issues that, you know, only happen in Central America or Southeast Asia or in China. And, and of course they, you know, these issues are um, deep systemic issues there too. But I think that it's really helpful. Yeah. To give, to get, you know, like this is, this is relevant to consumers at home, wherever you live, as it is to consumers, you know, it, overseas. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just going to step in and um, just steer. We've got about six minutes left of the dialogue. We could potentially go a little bit over, um, but I would like to um, start wrapping up. But before we do, um, I want Heist to share his um, 
insights into labeling and um, give the please do step in uh, to add any value to the dialogue as and when. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think um, it's very interesting what when I'm listening to Sarah talk, I'm um, realizing more and more that this all this exploitation we're seeing, whether it is in India or in the UK or anywhere, it's uh, it's implied in the system, right? It's 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 kind of ingrained in the DNA of this consumer-based capitalism that we are all taking for granted, and then. If we are confronted with the downside of that, uh, you know, the obvious response is like, oh, there should be some rule against it. And you know, if the government's not stepping in, then the next best thing uh, is presumed to be labeling. Um, I actually started my career in organic and fair trade certification, and I completely was, you know, was was on that. I was like, oh yeah, if only we can improve the standards and like nail them down so that you know inspectors would see everything and and maybe have you know more people involved in inspection however um i don't think right now i don't think that's that's um that's the path i think we should move towards a completely different way of relating so exactly like what kirti is doing you know not just knowing you're a producer but um she was even limiting her her profit you know which is kind of heresy in 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 mba speak you know you're um you're supposed to maximize your profit at at all cost um i think if as a brand you realize that the people that i'm working with are more important than my bottom line and the farmer realizes the same and the consumer realizes the same we will create you know like what charles eisenstein says is you know the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible and then we'll actually reclaim the economy to make it serve people and the planet rather than the other way around. So although I see the benefit of labeling, I think we can use it um, not just to uh, to control risk. And um, it, what happens with that, especially in India, we have a kind of a love-hate relationship with uh, with regulation. So you know, we get the license Raj. I remember there was a big deal in organic cotton where there was GMO creeping in. And then the government said, we need to regulate more which means that big producers can you know get the paperwork done and small producers they just fall off the track because they can't afford the inspections and the laboratory tests and the whatnot and the paperwork so i think there's a unintended consequence of uh, relying too much on labeling and um, and regulation so yeah i would say more relationship based business models and that also answers sunlini's question like how do you tell the the fake from the fact, you know, if you know the people across the screen, you know, if you would have say Zoom calls with your with your suppliers, if you're in a retail shop, uh, you can you know have a Saturday afternoon chat with uh, with the growers and the artisans, then you don't need to have that kind of labeling. Um, and um, yeah, okay, so that was I, I realized just that, that, that I agree. Uh, I completely agree. I think labeling can start with being voluntary. And uh, if we start on our own as to where it's coming from, rather than expecting it to come from the government because huge amount of issues are going to come along with that regulation. We recently got a notice on calling something Khadi and big brands are allowed to call it Khadi. Uh, so now it's the commercial brands uh, who are allowed to use a license because they paid for it. But actually weavers or farmers who are making Khadi cannot use it without the license. So um, it was really shocking, and we had to take down the name from our website, even though the fabric. Yeah, uh, Suki, sorry, I just want to add a point. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Um, the yeah. second thing is, uh, I think what I want uh, want to say is that this report has um, brought brought the topic to the forefront. Brands like um, Okai, if we are sensitized to the fact that there, are, there is an issue and that there are women farmers that we could source from, because unless somebody brings up the conversation, it, we are all busy sourcing fabric, making clothes, selling clothes. We don't think about it. So um, I think this conversation and today's conversation and the report itself will push a lot of us to source from organizations that yeah. are uh, 
compositions of women farmers, and that should help us push the numbers. Great, thank you. Yeah, Suki, just want to add, Suki, just want to add a couple of points uh, to what Kirti mentioned just now. So, 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 sure. So, I think uh, just a few things that uh, you know, ag agriculture being a state subject, I think you know, talking about policy and what government is doing, how much they have done. Uh, you know, I think at the central level, definitely agriculture has been a very, you know, a key important focus for the government. But when you talk about this you know, gender lens, you know, changing title rights and all of that, I just don't feel that, you know, that's something that will come top down. States at the, at the ground level, if we are able to kind of really build up consensus and advocacy from those, from the bottom up, where the voices can be heard, heard I think uh, that is the way to go to really kind of come up with policies which are more implementable and effective. And that's where I think, uh, you know, uh, this particular report becomes very important because it, that is the kind of lens it takes. It really does not talk about, okay, frame a policy, you know, top at the top somewhere and try to kind of force it down. It doesn't work like that. Second is, uh, second point I want to mention, you know, alluding to what Sarah just, uh, you know, kind of uh, touched on is post COVID, uh, the world, everybody's saying the world will you know, change, right? I mean, everything right from, you know, consumer behavior, their purchase decisions, um, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, uh, how brands react once the lockdown is over to the change demand scenario, all of that you know, are question marks. And I think this is a big, big opportunity to also, uh, you know, very consciously bring in this gender, uh, you know, dimension, uh, you know, in this, to make it an integral part of this change. You know, I think that's something that, you know, uh, the efforts uh, like this particular report should really kind of capitalize on. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Gitti, we can't hear you. Gitti, you're on mute, Hi. I believe. Hi. Um, as an action item, I'd like to urge everyone, all, all customers, uh, supporters of this cause, uh, to choose from women-led uh, businesses, women-owned businesses, and those businesses to choose from uh, uh, companies that are uh, involving women in the manufacturing process. And if we do that uh, for a while in the post-COVID world, uh, it will help us fill the gap. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, we have a flood of questions, but we are out of time. Um, we can conclude with a few closing remarks from any of the panelists that wish to say something. Abhishek, I believe you had something to say. Sorry, can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just I know we're laboring on the point a bit, but I just wanted to add a point. You know, I think what Kriti and Kais have said uh, with regards to all exploring and developing alternative models for production and consumption, I know they're definitely welcome. And I think nowhere else is it more relevant than in fashion uh, because there's just overconsumption already happening. So we need alternative models of consumption with underconsumption, repurposing, circular economy, all of that. But I think in the context of where we are today, and given that, you know, the change in the industry may, is going to not happen overnight. I think we need to recognize that a lot of our production today is happening at scale. Uh, and that's not going to disappear. There is livelihoods associated with that. Um, you know, there, there, are, um, there, is, there are just whole distribution, retail channels, everything. The system is get towards that as it stands today. Uh, we would love to explore alternative models of more local trade uh, where everybody is directly involved. But till that aspect picks up a bit more, um, I think there is a role for labeling in the current context uh, because you do need to ensure um, that there is um, certain standards and, and compliances with the law which are taking place. Because if it's left to every business to declare uh, we already have that in a number of private initiatives where uh, businesses self-declare that they are zero non-compliances or that they're following all the laws uh, of the land. Uh, and then when there is scrutiny that on that, you, you do discover uh, that things are amiss. So I think there is a role for labeling. Within labeling, I think one needs to recognize and understand 
what the governance framework of that labeling initiative is. So like at Fairtrade, we talk about having a multi-stakeholder uh, labeling uh, and participation in our governance. So producers, farmers and workers have a representation on our board. So we, we see that as an in integral part of ensuring that we are on the right track. Uh, and it also ensures that there is some degree of independence that you know, we are not being driven by a business agenda, but actually are being driven by the agenda of those who are most vulnerable. So I think that's one aspect of labeling uh, one can investigate and understand more. And then the other aspect which Fashion Revolution also talks about is transparency. Uh, transparency uh, with regards to uh, the final mile and, and, and initiatives that are promoting that. Um, uh, it can be a micro initiative or it could be a, a, a multinational initiative, but transparency is also going to be cr critical to that. And also how open is the initiative to uh, open to scrutiny? So whether it's through journalists or academics, uh, through independent research. And I think, you know, I'm not saying fair trade is perfect. We're far from it. We're not a magic bullet, but we are, we are constantly evolving to develop uh, as a labeling initiative uh, to get the feedback so that we're focused on impact and not profits. In fact, we are also uh, in our governance framework, uh, we, are, um, we are structured as a not-for-profit. So we are not driven by profits, we're, we're driven by impact. So I think um, one has to look at these kind of aspects as well in the current context while we continue to explore alternative models. Thank you so much for, for rounding that up, Abhishek. Great points. And I've had a few comments here. So Aburva Katari from No Nasty says, having said, he seconds that, brands will make what consumers demand. Um, so many questions. And I think what we're going to have to do is continue this on an Insta um, Q&A session and perhaps get some of the answers to the questions. Nitesh Square, thank you for your question. I know you've been waiting for a while for a response. Um, how easy is it to educate people at consumer level towards uh, the policies? Um, for example, his mother and grandmother might not care right now. Uh, they're at such an age in life where their basics of life is different. Um, we hear you. We understand that. Uh, Nitesh, I believe you are, you know, you are potential advocate for change for the future you can get to know um brands approaches to policies get to know our fashion transparency index um ask those questions continue to be curious be that age of change. um we can go in deeper um via our socials um i cannot take up more of your valued time panelists i thank you all for being here with us I would like to just share the conclusive element of our report uh, before we wrap this session up. So in conclusion, Shruti, I think now's the time where you can come in and conclude this report. Thanks, Suki. Um, it was a really, really wonderful discussion, and um, we would just like to um, say that this report um, is not the end, but a start to uh, promoting greater dialogue in this direction. And this was our pilot effort in uh, making sure that we can bring out some of the aspects of um, the challenges which are faced here. Um, there is immense scope for public and private players to collaborate creatively in mitigating these challenges faced by women farmers. And uh, we all can play a great role in this. And I look forward to hearing from all of you and uh, seeing that change uh, happen in uh, our society. Thank you so much. And just as this end quote um, puts it quite succinctly, every stakeholder can make a difference when they choose to procure from suppliers that hold fair, transparent and gender equitable global standards. They create space for a more sustainable cotton industry to bloom. Um, thank you all for being with us today. Our cotton policy dialogue report is available on our website, www fashionrevolution.org forward slash India. It's been a pleasure to have so many of you join us via YouTube Live, the questions on social, and also on our Zoom call. Um, 
we appreciate your inputs for today's session. Um, do continue asking those, in, those important questions. Um, it is Fashion Revolution Week this week. Uh, it is a time that we campaign for a fairer, safer, and more transparent fashion industry. You can all get involved. Um, there's many actions you can take. We'd love to hear your voice. Um, and I hope that here in India and well, some of you globally, uh, that we've kick-started Earth Day with something that is a great topic for us all to dive deeper into gender equity and its impact on sustainability in cotton farming in India. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye.